test as we did, as you were saying. Hello, thanks for coming back again. Let's remember the uh, example we're talking about here. We have uh, two treatments, a, a new treatment and a standard treatment. Uh, the outcome is the percentage patients who have improved. And we did our study and we found 60% of the standard treatment improved, 76% of the new treatment patients improved. We got a p-value of 0.015 and we looked at appropriately the confidence interval to give us a better measure of exactly what we did or did not learn from the study. Now, if the results of this study, so what you will see in your reading a paper, you'll see a p-value in a confidence interval and you'll see the, the estimates here. But remember what we're thinking here. Why are we looking at this small sample? This sample had only 100 patients in it. Why are we looking at this small sample and the results of this small sample in believing that uh, it's going to tell us something about our patients? Well, because we, believe, we have to trust that this small sample and the results are comparable to what we would have seen in the target population. And there's a presumption when you look at this p-value and you say, well, does it or does it not uh, relate to my particular patient? The presumption is the two samples that were used and were measured from are comparable in all the important characteristics except the, for the fact that they had different, tr different treatments. Okay? So, so where did this data come from? Well, we had to start with a sample. And so we had a sample of patients from the new treatment, and we have a sample of patients from the, I'm sorry, the new treatment and the standard treatment. And the issue is then, okay, the data must be representative of the samples. Well, how could the data not be representative of the samples? Well, the data could not be representative of the samples if we didn't measure everybody. Maybe pa patients dropped out of the study. Maybe patients failed to come back for clinic visit. And if there is a systematic reason that we didn't measure everybody, and that reason is related to the outcome, then that can create a bias. In other words, our comparison here is not fair because the, the, either it's not fair from the point of view of these percentages aren't reflective of the target population, or it's not fair from the point of view that maybe, maybe the samples themselves are not representative of each other. Remember, the assumption is, in terms of all of the important information and all of the important risk factors and all of the important uh, unmeasured variables, these two samples are supposed to be comparable in terms of those variables, the only difference being they receive different treatments. And where did the samples come from? They came from what I'm calling the sampled population, much larger population, that is more likely representative of the type of patients with that etiology that would have entered the study if uh, in that institution where the study is being carried out. Now, if the study is being carried out at multiple uh, institutions, well, the sample population would be the kinds of patients that could have entered into the study in the multiple uh, populations. Patients have to agree to participate in the study, so the sample could represent only a small proportion of the patients in the sampled population. And there may be a systematic selection of patients who are actually going into the studies. And now, if the centers are the same, that's one thing, but if the centers are different, then maybe there is a difference, a systematic difference between the patients who ended up in the sample in this, the, the two studies, uh, than the, the not. And, and, and this, this is more the situation you see when you're looking at medical pa papers. You have two or three different medical papers, and you're comparing them. Well, they were done at different times. They were done at different centers. So you wouldn't necessarily have only data coming from the same center going into this. You may have multiple center studies. 
in multiple centers. Then the question is exactly what is the target population for that sampled population? It has to be a representation of the target population, and the patient selection bias here might be selecting out certain types of patients so that it no longer represents the universal target population you were thinking of, and maybe it doesn't represent the kinds of patients you're talking about. Well, let me, let me, and now, how, how can you cut down the potential of bias somewhat? You can perform a randomized clinical trial, and what happens in the randomized clinical trial? The randomized clinical trial, the sample population is the same for the two treatment groups because if it's a multi-center study, you will certainly randomize within each center so that it would have comparable patients in the two uh, treatment groups. So the sample will be representative of the sampled population. So we know from, from this point into here, there is no problem. Because if it's a multi-center study, you're going to randomize into the two samples at each of the different centers. So we know we're okay at this point in a randomized study. We're still not okay, though, from the point of view exactly what is the target population. Because if you're going to randomize, you have to, of course, get permission from the patients. And we, don't, we do know that patients who say, yes, I will participate in a study, are systematically different from patients who will say, well, no, I'm not going to participate. We know there's uh, social, economic, and education factors that will lead uh, a certain patients or parents, in the case of uh, 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 pediatric hospitals, that will cause people to say yes versus no. The types of treatments you're comparing may have something to do with the percentage of patients and the types of patients who will actually enter your study. That may then cause questions as to be exactly what is the target population for that, for that study. Now let me tell you a few of these examples that I've run into. Okay? Uh, one recently, one, it's a, a study of cerebral palsy patients and they're being randomized either into uh, surgery or physical therapy to try to improve their uh, walking ability. And it turns out in that particular study that 20% of the time, roughly, the physicians changed the treatment that they were randomized to. And you can look at the data and you can see that it was a systematic change. If the patient had high walking ability relative to the other patients, they tended not to believe that they should get the surgery and they would put them into the physical therapy. So the physicians were failing to follow the randomization scheme. You know, these are the infamous protocol violations. Okay, so, and, and you could see that that was systematic because you could look at the uh, evaluation scores of the walking abilities of the two groups. So, again, the, the physicians didn't follow the plan as they should have, so that randomized study was basically destroyed by the physicians not following uh, uh, the, the scheme. And, you, you know, we have statistical procedures like, well, you use intention to treat and stuff like that. As soon as you start needing to do those things, the quality of the study is, is, is going down. In this particular case, 20% of the patients were not given the treatment they were randomly assigned to. Uh, that, that study would be suspect among even the people who supported the concept of the uh, surgery. Okay, so how can we kind of put these general statements into, into context? Now, if you want much more detail, we do have references for you to go to in the books and they'll give you much more and many more examples of why you need to worry about certain things. But in the interim, here's a suggestion of what you can do to uh, try to make these concepts a little bit clearer in your mind. Okay, from this brief description we've just done of the uh, patient flow, uh, you can see how there's, there's a possibility for getting a lot of uh, potential bias getting into a study. And I strongly urge you to look at some of these references that are on the website or others that you have to get uh, multiple examples of how bias has actually crept in clinical studies. But in the meantime, here, take a paper, why don't you take a paper that you're reading or a couple of papers that you're reading, 
and see if you can uh, see if uh, you believe there potentially could be some bias in the paper. And one thing I do want to mention, if there's a potential of bias, it doesn't mean there is bias. It doesn't mean there is bias, but the quality or the influence that paper will have, you, have on you will go down as the potential for bias maybe uh, increases. But look at the patient flow and see if there's a suggestion of bias either by the patient selection. You know, if only 10% of the patients actually that who potentially were asked to go into a study went into a study, that's very, very suspect. Okay, so you're going to look at the flow, the patient flow, to see if you think there may be bias. And the other thing you can look at is look at the tables describing the patients and the uh, uh, different treatments. And see if there seems to be a little bit of a favor of one treatment, one of the treatments versus the others in terms of having uh, fewer uh, risk factors than, than the other. Again, suggesting that maybe there was a subtle uh, selection of patients so that the basic final comparisons that the authors are making may be a little bit biased. And again, Looking for a multivariate statistical analysis is one way to see if the authors realize that there may be some confounding factors that have to be taken into account.